Barbara Wilkinson. She's a medical herbalist based in Cheshire. She's a trustee for the Herb Society. And we're going to be talking um, in our series about how to grow herbs. And today we are talking about St. John's wort, um, Hypericum perforatum. So I think most people quite often think of St. John's wort only for internal use and people often associate it with um, anxiety and depression. And you often think of all the contraindications or maybe you don't, but there are a lot of contraindications for using it with um, like SSRIs and serotonin because um, obviously it helps to increase serotonin levels in the body. Um, and you don't want to have too much of that because it can risk um, serotonin, what's the word? <laughs> Uh, well, imbalances, just imbalances. imbalances. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, and I think I, something that I quite like to use it for is to make it into an oil, and it can be used um, on the skin topically for everybody. You can use it with children as well as um, I've heard people using it with pregnant ladies as well. Um, and so it's really good there for using with nerve and any nerve pains and muscle pains, scars. Um, sunburns, burns, any wounds, um, what else? Post-radiation, I've heard people talking about using it for cancer treatment and having a lot of good effects with that. Um, also itchy skin with like eczema and um, like it kind of cools the itchy skin. Um, and if you've got like bites, anything like that. Um, yeah, I think so nerves are a big thing when you think of St. John's wort. So think like numbness or shooting pain or tingling, um, sciatica, I don't know if I said that already, and um, uh, shingles. I know we used it before for a friend when he had shingles and I think that helped quite a lot. So, but today we're going to talk about how you might find it uh, growing in the wild and how you might grow it in your garden. So, hi Barbara. <laughs> Hello, morning. Can I just pick up on one thing you said in your introduction, which was which was great, by the way. Um, it's like ticking boxes as to what things can do and can't do, isn't it? One of the, the things we do have to watch is that for people that are having um, light therapy, UVA light therapy, um, UV therapy, I should say, and that's sometimes people that have psoriasis, chronic psoriasis. Um, I wouldn't really be recommending it internally or externally while they're having that process done. So any radio or laser type therapy, um, I would avoid it. And it, it's simply because there, there was contraindications some time ago about um, in Australia on cattle in the heat of the high summer that they were shown to be photosensitive and it was affecting them. But it can happen in humans. So I'm also a little bit cautious when I'm treating somebody and then suddenly they've decided to go off to the sun for a fortnight and bake on a sunbed. <laughs> I suggest that they stop a few weeks before using internally or externally um, as well. Yeah, yeah. When I was in that sunbed, I didn't mean obviously before you yeah. got the sun, <laughs> but I meant for like, yeah, afterwards maybe. Yeah, afterwards you can yeah. use it for sunburn, certainly, but it, it can raise that photosensitivity in some people and of course if um, if some women are on the contraceptive pill it can knock out that as well mm. so you've got to be a little bit careful with the contraceptive pill internally um, in, yeah in well yes mainly internally of course because it can upset things but I mean it is a fabulous plant and it is um if you in, if you're into astrology and the understanding of plants as Culpepper was and many of us still are today then its planetary influence is the sun. It's, um, it's connected to the sun. And everything about the sun is to do with heat and warmth and light and brightness. And it's about restorative. So when you think that we've come through winter in the Northern hemisphere and we've been affected by a lack of light and warmth and sun, then this is one of the perfect herbs in many ways to be using during the time of the cold and the damp. Because a lot of people now refer to terms such as SAD syndrome and things of that sort. And of course, it's, um, it helps us to rebalance mentally and physically. Um, so putting the sun back in our life with plants related to that planet, I, I personally have found to be of exceptional value to people over the winter months. I think it's very important. Great plant to grow it or find, isn't it? And then make it into an oil and use it throughout the winter. Just to kind of keep Absolutely. It Preserve it. Yeah. It's all about the preservation of what nature's offered us 
and how to, how to keep that and how to have it by us for when we need it. Um, and that's why we lay herbs down in oils and tinctures and dry them and, and do all sorts of other things because everything has its window in time when it's at its peak, when it's at its best. And for therapeutic properties, we're trying to harvest and store in the correct way so that we keep the therapeutics right, that we don't lose them. Um, if, even if it's ones that you, you'd want to use fresh, isn't it? So you'd want to use a, rather than a dried? Ideally, yeah. ideally, but that's not always possible, is it? So you no. might need to turn to the tincture or you might need to have some of the dried. If it's dried appropriately, and it's stored appropriately, um, then you can use it during the winter months, even to make a herbal tea. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's nice to use. Anyway, so to come to your question. <laughs> yeah, so let's talk about propagating. How do we yeah. grow it? Propagating, well, it, it's, it's what we would class as a wild herb, really. It's plentiful throughout Europe. Um, it does particularly well in like wild areas, waysides and all sorts of places. And you usually see it in great profusion, not just a tiny little bit of it. Um, we often notice things because of the colour that starts to stand out. So we're often recognising it when it's in full flower. And when it's not in flower, it tends to blend in with other things and we might not notice it like, like a lot of plants. Um, but it it's one of those that you want to be a little bit careful about your garden unless you've got acres of land and that's your garden and you know and you've got wild areas um where you can let it be generous and spread and um and come out in great profusion i mean i grow it on my allotment i introduce it to my allotment because i like to ensure that i've got the right species for using for herbal medicine um and there's a lot of high pericums. There's a terrific amount. Um, and you can very easily be um, identifying incorrectly and getting the wrong one. Or you can even be sold the wrong one. I've known a number of students that have bought from different sources and they've not actually got the high pericum perforatum, the very one that they need to be using. Um, and when, when you're a student and when you're learning like anybody, um, you need these things pointing out as to what to look for on identification. So it's, so it's important. So I always say, go to herb specialists as opposed to your general other places and your garden centers, or, or speak to people that you know who are well-versed and that grow and that can identify and that can recognize things for you. Frankly, although you can buy the seed, um, I wouldn't bother because it's so generous in Europe that if you go to the right place, or the right person you'll find it and people like me are only too willing to share it because it's very successful I have lots and in actual fact I have far more every year than what in reality I need in my practice so I regularly have students and herb walkers and, and the people that I know and I'm, I'm only too glad to share it and know that they've actually got the right plants yeah yeah so one so of the things you can tell us is it's called perforatum because of the holes on the leaves, isn't it? Yeah, there's, there's also little, um, the dots really, they look like black dots and you can only really notice them if you hold one of the very small leaves because they are small up to the light or the flower head and look through the petals and you notice these black dots. Some people think, oh, they're insects or it's got a disease or something. But in actual fact, those are the oil glands. That's where the, the oil is. Um, so the oil is in the flower heads as well as in the in the leaves. But when we harvest, we tend to harvest what we call the flowering tops, mm -hmm. um, the the uppermost, because they're quite a tall plant. Um, they, they grow ooh, feet and inches and meters. It's all a bit uh, are you metric or aren't you? Mm -hmm. But to me, they're about two and a half feet um, tall, something like that. They can be taller, dependent on the conditions, of course, that they're grown in. Um, I never feed the earth that the actual uh, St. John's wort grows in because my understanding of many herbs is that the tougher you grow them, the better the therapeutic properties. And it, you can overnourish some things um, and then they, they become weaker in the therapeutics. So I don't really do much um, feeding at all. Uh, I let it find its own roots and its own earth. So how does hypericum spread? Does it spread, is it like a root system or does it spread with, with seeds? Yeah, it does both actually. Because if you were to leave some of those flowering tops on, if you don't remove them all, then obviously the flowers will turn to seed and then they'll distribute, they'll drop 
virtually where they are, I get blown in the wind. Mm -hmm. It's not like a dandelion. It's not that kind of a seed. It's quite different. So they would they would drop around and birds will take them off as well. Obviously, and other animals will take them off because they become food for other wildlife and not just for us. So they, they end up um, going by seed, but also by root. They can propagate uh, by root as well. But it's very easy to dig a, a clump up and just put that in the ground and it will spread. And um, just yesterday on my allotment, I filmed a little bit for Instagram, which I'll put out at some point. And you can see all the new growth. It's lovely. And it's all in little clumps. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by all sorts of everything else that needed bit of a tidy up because it's that time of the year when I do a bit of a tidy up because I don't do a lot because herbs like St John's work will grow through very grassy areas yeah. you know with a lot of other companions around it uh, you know it, it really doesn't it's it's not too precious it's um it will come through and it, it often is growing in grass and, and popping through mm -hmm. and it puts its head well above the height of the grass and the other things so it, it's okay but I do tend to on the allotment I clear some of the some of the grass off because I've got a lot of moss that's come on over winter because I've done nothing I've just left it so you get moss and then you get grass uh, grass developing so I take some off and um and I just love to see it coming through and it's such a pretty color at the moment the young leaves yeah so um how does it take to spread so like would you if you if you planted it one in one season would you expect that the following season it might start spreading definitely it'll spread no matter what you do okay. yeah I was trying to I've been because I planted some last year in my garden and I've been watching it to see if it's going anywhere but I haven't noticed I've only noticed it in the same two areas that it was already but maybe I'll just start maybe I haven't noticed it and it's somewhere else already <laughs> yeah well it it will generally spread where you've put it it's just that you'll get more clumps coming up because the seeds will drop and that will yeah. grow on and a bit of root growth as well so it's not like mint it doesn't it it's not as invasive as mint, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because it doesn't have all these huge, fast growing runner, runner roots. So it's, it's quite different in its habit, really. It's more compact in its habit. Mm -hmm. So you won't get it all over the garden very quickly. It'll generally stay where you've put it. But it does spread with a bit of wind, you know, like on the allotment, it ends up in another bed. And it's um, amazing just how far it does get. <laughs> and um, oh, I forgot I was nasty. Uh... How many clumps you were thinking, I think, how many would you buy if you wanted to? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you wanted to get it going, how would you, how many would you find or buy or, you know? Yeah. Well, it, the garden rule often is um, that you do odd numbers and you buy threes and fives and you do things like that when you okay. never buy one of something. Um, and I think it, the same goes for herbs because, you know, you're sharing your plants with nature and something might come along and take a fancy to it and might nibble it down constantly. Um, or just completely remove it as, as, as some wildlife actually does or the plant just might you know fade away and and not not thrive for whatever reason so never buy one of something I always say buy two or three yeah. <laughs> give yourself a chance or give it a chance yeah. <laughs> and does it did you say it likes quite dry areas yeah, it does quite well it well drained it doesn't like boggy wet it doesn't like having its feet in in, in boggy um wet circumstances because it yeah it it it's all about the sun and the dryness and um and it likes that it likes quite dry conditions so it likes free drainage soil free draining soil really um and it seems to thrive very well on that being a sunny leo plant so when you when it has um grown and when when would you start harvesting it would you harvest in the first year or would you wait and let it establish a little bit depends how well it's doing really and, and how much flower heads you've actually got um, and if you want of course some of those flowers to turn to seeds then you're going to want to leave a bit aren't you so that it drops and it and it multiplies um, so it's it's very much how much you've actually got mm -hmm. so usually when you're harvesting anything you only take about a third and you leave the rest certainly in the first year so things can grow on and they can multiply. But it, but with high pericum, it's it is quite generous, and there's lots of tiny little flowers that produce lots of tiny little seed. So it, it you know, it will multiply quite rapidly. It's not like a different herb with just one flower head, maybe, and not that much seed. So it, it's all dependent on the, that particular plant. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so at the beginning, we were talking about um, you were talking about um, collecting the flower heads. 
so that's like what would you say the top like mm. or something or of the plant and would you take yeah. leaves as well well it's it, the leaves, it, isn't there this but it tends to come up on on stems and then yeah. can multi-branch and then you've got quite a lot of head growth really um you've got quite a lot of airy tops with all the flowers on and the flowers come out in different successions they're not all out at once Mm -hmm. um, but you want them sufficiently open when you're harvesting for, for medicine and things. So you want them with still with the little um, stamens and the little pollen on, if you can get it like that, a bit like when you're harvesting from trees, when you're getting other flowers. But you'll always notice that some of the flowers are still in bud. And that's absolutely fine. So it's just timing it that you have enough of the flowers out some might have even faded the very first flush might have just gone past the best but you want those that are mainly you want it at a time when it's mainly fully open so really it's weather dependent mm -hmm. and our weather is changing as we know and a lot of the books especially if you look at old books on gardening now we can be way off with what month to plant and what month to harvest just like with everything else so you've really got to go off what's happening now this year right now um, with what's going on so watch and wait and it's it's very um, traditional to harvest St John's wort um, in June and those flowering tops usually don't consist of just the flowers and the flower buds but there'll, there'll be some leaves on there as well so you don't want the whole stem although you can cut the whole stem and you can dry it on the stem or take it home to then remove like the top three four inches I would say something like that. It's a bit like picking nettles early in the green when they're just coming out. You want about the tops of the three, four inches. And even when they're growing on a bit, you know, another few weeks and they've got much taller, I still only want the top three or four inches. I don't want the rest of the plant. And if you just take the tops in, in, in things like nettles, of course, they'll, they'll multiply. You'll get multi-stems like sweet peas and other things. So, but with St. John's wort, you're just taking that top three or four inches. So you're getting a combination of unopened buds, faded flowers but the majority will be the open flowers with all the pollen still on so and some, watching, some through this, through, watching your plant really aren't you to notice when it's yeah. ready to pick yeah and i presume you can't go away on holiday basically you can't, <laughs> you can't go away because you miss it something happens so you've yeah if you know you've got the certain times in the calendar when you know that this is ready that should be ready you know i need to be looking out so we're always doing that observational we're nature watchers that's what we are and we're you know we're part of nature so we're we're watching it all the time we're observing and we're looking and we're learning and if we're if we're well connected with our plants we know exactly when the best time is and and we don't always get it right something might have happened and we haven't been able to just chance and get it right but different parts of the country it will be different times you know the south the north and scotland and ireland were all a bit different in the uk as to when things are at the best so you can't say just go and get st john's wort on the 24th of june it will be at its best and that's the one day to do it that's a tradition related to st john's the baptist and that's what its name and connection is with and it's a tradition and for some of us traditions are something we like to keep with but it might just not be the right day. Yeah. <laughs> we might have to wait. Because, I mean, does it make a difference if, like, say you wanted to pick on the 24th, but it had been raining for a week beforehand? Yeah. One of those plants you don't really want to pick when it's wet? Absolutely, absolutely. Or, or even dew, you know, dew affects our plants and there might be too much moisture involved. And that's why we often say when, we, when we're harvesting that the best time to collect is around 11 a.m., you know, after the dew's gone or even midday in some cases. Sometimes that's too hot. You have to literally go off the season, mm -hmm. the temperature, the light, everything. But you don't want to be harvesting flowers, which are very delicate when, they've, when they're, you know, covered in raindrops or they've got all the dew all over them. So mm -hmm. timing's important uh, as much as time of day. Um, also weather conditions and as you say if it's been throwing it down then you know there are some years like I, I had the the other year with lime flowers the weather was so bad uh, when I needed to harvest the trees and uh, I didn't guess any because mm -hmm. it, it was so wet it was just not not the right you know so I lost a whole year of lime flower harvest yeah yeah I had the same with uh, elderflowers <laughs> it was like yeah. there wasn't any point yeah it happens fortunately 
most of our herbs will stay full of vitality if harvested right and stored right for a good two year period in the dried state. Mm. So we've got two years, you know, we'd, we like to just do a year and uh, then have got rid of them or, and, and then get the new season, you know, the other year. But, but we do know that actually they keep the vitality well for a good couple of years. But after that, no, they should be gone. Okay. And so while we're talking about that, so how would you, apart from the knowing how long it's been there for, I mean, when you know it's done by the smell, I, you know, I'm guessing, but like people that don't know, how would you say that you would notice a herb was past this useful? In, it, in its dried state. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, colour is, is one of the ways. Some things don't retain the colour very well. Mm -hmm. um, um, when you've been drying herbs a lot, you'll you get to notice which ones do retain well and which ones don't. So it's normal for them not to retain well. But if you've dried them and they, and they still look good, and then when you look at them some time later and they're not and the colours really change, then you know they've lost a lot. They've lost a lot of vitality and perhaps they shouldn't be doing that. And also the fragrance. Yeah, you've got to use your senses. Um, if there's the slightest bit of um, not appearing as they did when you first did first did them, and they're going a bit musty as well, then definitely they want ditching. Um, they're not right. They've not they've not been stored well. Um, and and sometimes you know you think you've dried them really well, um, especially if you're doing passive drying, and you might then store them and find just a little bit of dampness retained within them, and so they've actually you know gone moldy. They're not right, so they've got to go. Um, so you've got to you've got to use your senses really. So if you were drying her pericum, how would you be drying it? Would you recommend um, it? I, I do a lot of passive drying. I don't even um, have herb dryers and I'm a professional medical herbalist. I do have a super airing cupboard system, um, which I've learnt skills of um, each herb, how long it needs and, and what the systems are. And of course, the summer months are wonderful because I can dry in and around the house in appropriate places out of direct sunlight. And um, I, I do that. So I don't actually have these dehydrators, which are on for hours and hours with a lot of noise and a lot of electricity. I'm very old school. And I find that they, they retain everything that I need them to retain. And I enjoy doing it that way. Mm -hmm. quite, quite traditional, really. By St John's Water is when you pick it um, and you either put it in oil or if you just squish it, you know, it's yellow, yeah. the flower, but when you squash it or put it in oil, it turns red which is, you know, it's, it's also, yeah. I think, connects, it seems to me, it connects to that kind of fire element with that kind of redness. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Not not Mars, not the planet Mars, which is red, of course, but the sun does have the sunspots and does have the redness. And that, that's another indicator, in a way, that it's to do with the heart and the circulatory system, especially the arteries. Um, so it's almost, um, it's not blood red, but it's that, it's that red indication. Okay. Uh, most plants that have red connections are, are good for the heart in, in one way or another. And uh, yeah, it's lovely to do when you're on herb walks and, and events and you're out, especially not just with children, because we've all got that child within our hope, but it's, it's fun to just take a bud off or a flower and just rub it and um, and see this red, red oily um, sort of discoloration occurring. And of course, if you, if you drop them into um, oil to, to make oils and, and ointments, then it changes very quickly. But it's important to keep them in the sun, you know, when you're doing your oils, not to put them in the dark, but to actually have them in the sun. And again, I'm, I'm quite old school. I like to, I like to um, do my herbs in the summer and use the sun mm -hmm. as, uh, as a way of turning my oils. I don't like to do it in a double boiler system and quick, um, I like things to take time. I like to live with it and watch it. So it kind of, I suppose it's kind of reacting, isn't it, with the heat or something that's bringing out the more, the red colour? Yeah, well, it's a form of infusion. It's just like making a cup of tea, isn't it, really? If you put yeah. your leaves, whether they're dry or fresh, into, into the right uh, water in that case, then they will exude into the water. So you might get a colour change, but you certainly get a flavour change and you get all sorts of other things going on. It's the same with the oil. So it's, it really, it's infusion or maceration or you know it's all these um terms which really it's an it's another way of allowing the chemical components and all the other things that the herb contains to actually offer itself up into whatever liquid form you put i mean it's like putting things in honey or putting them in glycerides or putting them in alcohol and water they will 
you know, they will give up. They give up their properties. Right, so when when you've um, come to the end of the season and you've picked all, well, not all, but you've picked a third of your um, flowering tops, what would you then do? Would you just just leave them? Like, what would you do at the end of the season? Yeah, I'm I'm a great one for leaving things. I'm not a tidy up freak that um, everything must be cleared. And when when you've got um, perennial herbs, which these are, then they're going to be there all the time. So it's not a quick case of um, dig them up and get rid of them. It's not like an annual in any way. In fact, even with my annuals, I leave them because the seed heads are going to um, self-sow. They're going to um, provide for all wildlife. And I find them quite attractive throughout the winter. If I go down on a cold and frosty morning or something and I go and have a wander around the allotment, there's all sorts of different architectural structures just from plants themselves. I mean, we all know about fennel seeds and other things that look stunning and hogweed and that. But it's amazing. Our, our plants, even in the fact that they've offered up the best and they've finished as such, they've still got something to offer. And um, so I, I, I just leave things actually and the time to tidy up is like now I wait until again it's weather dependent and the season dependent and um but yeah end of February beginning of March is when I start to actually clear and that's what I was doing yesterday actually I was I took my secateurs and I was just cutting because I'd already cut the stems of most of them but I, I might have three or four inches just of the old dead wood of the old stems on the high pericum and the new shoots are coming through so I want to just cut them a bit lower they drop off they do their own thing they disappear eventually and return to the earth but i just clear them and i put them in the compost okay so you wouldn't leave them like right lying like cut them and leave them where they work anything to compost down you could but with woody stems which hypericum is they'll take longer mm -hmm. and um you might you might want it looking a little bit different than that so i just chop them up and put them in the compost bin Mm -hmm. everything activates in the compost bin they were, <laughs> I used to mine and it probably doesn't sound very good but I used them for um lighting my fire the other day because I had a whole yeah work. yeah she's she very nice it worked so yeah the fire well that's what you would have done is kindling really and then yeah. you know if you've got um, open fires and things, or even these people that have got fire pits and all sorts of things, then you've got plenty of supply of everything. I've only just cut back my solid ego um, because usually over winter I'm doing workshops and we're making stars and doing other craft things from the stems. And of course, this year I haven't been able to do it. Mm -hmm. So I use the flowering tops, but I've only just cut the rest of the stems and chopped them and they're all in compost. Yeah. I don't have an open fire, or they would be. I do have friends that have, so I regularly give them other bags of kindling <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good because then you can use like you know the whole of the the herb yeah. whole of the plant yeah i would just say that it's um for me it's a herb that uh, restores harmony okay. and balance in the body um emotionally and physically and um it's for me i use it a lot as a pain reliever which you touched on more than an antidepressant um, and if people have got high anxiety, I wouldn't actually use it. I would choose to use other things. But I, I do see that as a restorer, it works with the liver, that huge organ that is vitally important to support and, and look after. And St. John's work does that. It's, it's hugely important because it is a bitter herb. If you, if you taste it as a tea, which not many people do, you often need to mix it with other things, but you should try things on their own, the flowering tops, those flowers and the leaves. And if you taste it as a tea, you don't need a lot, but it is very bitter. It's got a bitter principles in there. And of course, bitterness affects itself in that people who are, let's say, bitter in their character emotionally, they're usually angry and frustrated. And that all stems from the liver. So there's that huge connection of, we need to give the liver some bitters to help to reduce anger and frustration and support the liver. And then it helps to restore us and perhaps our lost visions and our journey in life. Our direction might be a bit lost. We might be slightly going off at a tangent and need to just be drawn back to perhaps where we should be to restore the harmony in our lives. And I think St. John's Wort is very much one of those herbs. So on an energetic level, it's doing it's doing many things. Mm -hmm. It's very, very restorative. And it, of course, again, because of its sun connection and the planets, it brings us out of darkness. 
mm-hmm. emotionally and physically. So it's it's important to us. So it's uh, it's a great herb, and um, for, wouldn't like to do without it. So for that, um, would you be taking that as a tea for that? For that, always, always internally, yeah, always. Uh, but re- we've got to remember that you know if we were to make um, the oils, as we've said, and the ointments. Um, everything that we put on our skin is absorbed and we'll get to the liver. Yeah. So, it, you know, we, we mustn't forget that whether we use it externally or internally, it's impacting on us, not only physically, but emotionally as well. Mm-hmm. So, and on an energetic level. And it's important that it's, it works on many levels in, men, in many layers. Mm-hmm. All to our benefit. We mentioned, um, tinctures, did we? Would you no. use the tincture as well? Yes, I make a lot of tincture and I, and I do it from fresh plant material. I don't dry it first. Okay. Um, I do that with a lot of tinctures that I make. I like the fresh plant material. Um, so, yeah, and I, I use a lot of it. But my main usage in practice is a pain reliever. Okay. I think it's very, very important for people with all these labelled conditions that they've got. Um, and, I, and I do find it extremely useful. So it, it goes into lots of blends. I never, I never give tinctures on their own, as simples. I, I put them in together, usually about seven or eight different herbs that are blended specifically for that unique individual. And was it for like kind of chronic pain conditions you're talking any, about? Any pain at all, because of course, when we're not well, um, and especially if it's uh, pain related, then it what it affects us emotionally. Mm-hmm. You know, people say, "Oh, I get used to it. I live with pain every day." Then why why are you doing that when you you don't need to? You know, we can help with that and get to perhaps the root cause of the problem. We can certainly uh, relieve pain with some excellent pain relieving herbs, and this is one of the main ones, in my opinion. I wonder if that's also because like cause there's a big um, connection between like the nerve nervous system and pain. So if you're really you know if your nervous system is really highly engaged, then you're more likely to feel pain. And if it's a nerve, a ner- what's it, a nervine, um, yeah, it will also have that kind of dual effect. It, I suppose with the pain relief. Absolutely, absolutely. You've got to work both mentally and physically mm-hmm. for for all of us. You know, you've got to be very much aware of that and uh, support both. Mm-hmm. always support both and you, um sorry would you class it like as a nourishing herb as well yes i would because in fact all herbs are nourishing because they contain chlorophyll they contain vitamins and minerals flavonoids antioxidants you name it there's a, a raft of things and people often forget that about herbs mm-hmm. especially herbs such as this because they think well they're not food that i eat yeah. like other herbs they tend to forget, but yeah, they, they nourish and they nurture. They, they're full of different nutritional elements. Mm-hmm. So having them as teas is a wonderful way with, with most herbs of having them. Yeah, I was just thinking there as well, because if it's nourishing and that's keeping me quite supportive as well for the, you know, for your, obviously your nerves and then the pain as well. So it's kind of like an all-rounder almost, I think. Absolutely, absolutely. And I've used a lot of it in the last 12 months. Um, I, I, I use a lot in practice generally anyway, but um, I've used a lot in the last 12 months because there's been so much heightened anxiety and fear with the, with the uh, last year that we've had. And that will remain for a very long time, sadly. Um, and we need to help people recover from this period of time. Um, and, and this is one of our main herbs that we can be doing to uh, to nurture people and to help them. And for people to understand that it's normal to feel like they do. Some people have experienced situations this year. They, they never dreamt that they personally would experience. And um, it, it's affecting everybody. Yeah. So we've, we've got to do something about supporting those that seek us out. Yeah. And I think one way to do that, to help that is also if you, if you can grow some herbs as well because then you've got that connection with the nature and the kind of the observation absolutely. that we talked about in our last podcast um, absolutely Rox. it's the, it, it's one of the most important things i think the the last year has shown people that everything's out of control mm-hmm. and there's not much that they can do or influence and decisions are being made that maybe they might not agree with or they're not comfortable with or they don't understand and so to give people um the permission if you like to go and find plants and learn about them and to use them. It empowers people. Mm -hmm. And 
and that's what we talked about last time. Our ancestry, our our background in life as humans is precisely that. That's what we used to do in our tribes, in our villages. We would have passed our knowledge on. We would have shared. We would have recognised um, what people needed and, and how to support them. And there's nothing better, is there, than, than that sense of achievement that I've, I've learned to maybe bake a loaf of bread for the first time in my life or paint something that looks half decent, but to be able to go out and recognise a plant that I've learned about and then to actually come back and try it. Mm-hmm. I mean, how empowering. And that more than anything, that's what I hope that people do in, in, with herbs in life. You know, it's it, it's all about education. Yeah. It's all about that disconnect that there's been. That you know, the, the most important thing is that we we are so connected um, naturally that we we need to encourage more and more of it. Yeah, and I think as well there was like there was a problem like at least at the beginning of the lockdowns and stuff where everybody was trying to get herbs and there was a bit of a problem with availability yeah. and stuff. And I think that kind of has made a lot of people think, okay, well maybe maybe that empowering and take control for ourselves to be able to grow and harvest and use our own without having to rely on external sources to get things from other places. I think Absolutely. That's- Self-sufficiency is vitally important. Yeah. And, it, you know, for, for everything, for our food and our drink and herbs, part of that, and they've, they've got lots of medicine and therapeutic properties. But, you know, the trees that line our streets, you know, many, many people don't know that the very things they actually need to be utilising and using but sometimes it's not because we brew it, we taste it, we eat it, we tincture it, we do whatever we do. It's just the mere fact we're going to touch that bark or we visually, we see that blossom or we inhale that fragrance. You know, that's, that's our connections with nature. You know, we don't, we don't have to necessarily ingest something to get the benefit. Just the, the pure beauty of something yeah. is, it might be enough. Yeah. Even, just, even just thinking about it, I mean, I often say to people who can't sleep, for example, just imagine the plant that I've shown you today, maybe on the herb wall. Let, let's say that it's um, lime flower, a uh, lime tree, or let's say it's valerian or something. Just imagine it. In, the imagination is the key to life in many things because it's what rules us. Mm-hmm. Our imagination is, is, is important. And imagination is usually... Um, better in some than in others certainly in creative types and often it's the creative people with the wild imaginations that have the more anxiety Mm -hmm. I think as well like you know herbalists always talk about um drinking teas and things and sometimes a lot of people don't like drinking them or they don't like the taste of something so I think like for example for the St John's walk that we're talking about today you can get all those benefits for drinking tea but you can also get all the benefits for making it into an oil like you're saying because it's going to seep into your skin anyway so it's a different way that you can use it yeah. to that, those benefits without having to yeah make yourself drink a cup of tea if it's really absolutely it's good, if you're not going to enjoy it and like it's gonna it's kind of defeats the purpose a little bit well there, there is absolutely no point in a in a herbalist for example or, or somebody at home doing something and then going oof I just don't like it I won't do that again I mean what what is the point in that so you've got to find a way of of taking something on board so uh, uh, and a way of enjoying it now one of the naturopathic ways of dealing with things is to actually have a foot bath Mm -hmm. or a bath or a hand bath and I personally especially with elderly people who can't get in and out of baths and people who no longer have baths they only have showers a hand bath at any time of the day, it's an absolute luxury. People pay a fortune in spas and places to go and be pampered and, and do this thing. Yet you can do it for yourself. Mm-hmm. You can get your washing up bowl and you can put your, your very strongly brewed herbs, like brewing a tea, but you, you put them in, you can have them floating in the water. You don't even have to strain them and yeah. just immerse your feet in. And yes, you might be sat watching television, but you know, a 20 minute soak, what a luxury what a pamper yeah because i mean you, you're getting it through your skin but then you're also smelling the aroma of it and it's that you know. yeah it's everything you've got the visual you've got the touch mm-hmm. you've got the fragrance and it just brings you down back into it's restorative yeah it brings you back into balance and naturopathy is a key player in everything that we do 
And I, I'm trained in both herbal medicine and naturopathy because of the course that I did. And, and often people forget that the simplest things, it's like applying herbs as a poultice or, or whatever. These are things that we used to do. Yeah. And now we see them as something that we go and pay somebody else to do for us. And it's usually with, with loads of chemicals. Yeah. And now take it back to basics and put your plants in water and see what happens. It's the, visu the visual and the imagination is healing. Mm -hmm. In fact, actually, I've, you can also, when we're talking about imagining the herbs, you can take a little bit of herb, can't you? And put it under your pillow, sort of that kind of dreaming with the plants. So just invite Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Absolutely. We used to carry them around, didn't you? Maybe in like a, a wee locket or something or a, a oh, yeah. bag or yeah. pouch or something. It's just like what, another way to bring doing? it. Why aren't we still doing it, Rox? Why yeah. haven't we got these things? I mean, I attach cleavers to me regularly, mm -hmm. like kids used to do and have fun with it, you know, because I'm, I'm loving seeing it at this time of the year and I'm consuming it in all different forms and I'm harvesting and I'm doing all sorts. Of, I'm just so absorbed in, in, in the plants that are coming up. I'm just loving them, the colour, the vitality and the, and the future, knowing what's coming and how much more abundant they're going to be. It's only just the start of the yeah. season. So to surround myself and wear them, you know, I, I've been known to make a quick garland and wear it on the allotment and stick things behind the ear and all sorts of things, you know, and I have even my kitchen apron. And when I do demonstrations and workshops, you know, I'll, I'll pin hers to me with my brooch. I'll just push them through. I mean, live with them.